Another day at the office for Joey Dunlop, where speeds approaching 200 miles per hour are the norm. For 28 years, Dunlop has lived with danger and overcome many a tragedy, when his bravery and dedication have been tested to the limit. At 45, he still remembers vividly his first race in 1969 and how it all started. Brother-in-law, he used to race a lot. But he had actually stopped racing for a couple of years and we were up to about in road bikes and scramblers around fields, or actually road bikes around fields. And just happened to be talking one day and he says to me, just whenever I came to age, he says, you're very good at riding these motorbikes. He says, you know, I used to race. He says, you should try it. And that's how it came about. Him and me started in the winter time and worked at a Triumph Cub. And that's some basis for me to race. I took to the nose very, very quickly. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I did so well on the road. I just, like people take to scramblers and can't ride road racing bikes. And I took to road racing and I took to roads. And uh, to one of my first road races, even to, I remember riding my first road race. It was, Tandagi, you couldn't believe it. <laughs> the man who was to become a folk hero was on the road. Since then, he's won five Formula One world titles, 22 wins at the Ulster Grand Prix, 13 victories at the Northwest, and there's a record 21 successes in the Isle of Man. And this year, he'll take five bikes, his most ever, to the circuit where he's idolised, the TT. Well, what can anybody say about Joey's achievement? I don't think it'll ever be anybody ever equal it. He is the master of the TT and uh, a complete legend. 1977 was your first TT win. The Jubilee Classic, what are your memories of that? <laughs> Pure luck, I think. It's, I was riding a 750 Yamaha and, and to keep a 750 four cylinder two stroke going for, that was four lap race, four laps round there was pure luck <laughs> and uh, I, can, I can remember most of the race and uh, I had about wee bits of trouble during the race and that I just used my head and just then he would say keep your fingers crossed Tom Hearn took me around the course before and he says if he couldn't want it I used to want it because he wanted an arrangement and he wanted it. <laughs> I can remember that because he took me around and it did me a lot of good because to set me in the second year in the 750 around the TT was, was scary, put it that way. So when did you realise you had your first TT won? Was it on the third lap, the fourth lap? Oh, the fourth lap, I remember coming down uh, and I knew I could near enough free wheel to the lane. And I finished went wrong and I was that afraid of opening the bottle of champagne and Everything looks at the, just going through. <laughs> I never opened one in my life before, and I don't know how, how you would open it or what you do with it or anything about it. I can remember that. I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if I should have won this or would I break down? <laughs> but uh, I kept it going anyway. And he's kept it going ever since. At the start of a TT race, it's one man and his thoughts. An hour and 20 minutes of hard riding lie ahead. The TT is different because you're riding on your own, and I was always good at that. If I can get out on my own, I can go as quick as any any other rider that's there. Without any trouble, I can I can go as quick. That's when you're running among the short circuits and you're diving in and pushing people out of the way. That's where I, I think now in, in, in my later career, I'd like to bike up, you know, and saying, look at that silly. <laughs> but again, I used to be like, hey, do the same thing. And the TT, you're not doing that. You're on your own. And if I get on my own and get going, I can still go as quick as on so here's this torturous and very demanding 37 and three quarter mile circuit. And when you stand there waiting for that light, you have no fear. Oh, you have fear, you have. But see, once you get to pray hell, it's gone. Everybody's the same. You watch Philip and it's just sitting, jumping. Philip's the same. Once that flag drops, you're now a completely different world. You're on your own. This next left hander down here, really in, in race conditions, is flat out, and you have to be judging it till like six inches. And flat out's what? And flat out. Well, the RC45 has been doing 175 to maybe up to 108 mile an hour. Do you have exact racing lines in the Isle of Man? 
Just over the mountain, you would have more of a, more of a, a racing line. Along this bit here, it's rough and it's bumpy, and, and everybody seems to have their own their own way of doing it. Especially the next section, there in about a few miles. And this is the pub here, along on the right hand side, Crosby Pub. You can see the people all standing at it. And the gears was. Again, you go through, I think we tried to count them out one time, but you couldn't count them. thousands of gears every lap. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Because uh, actually during TT week, you have to tape your foot all up and, to keep the skin on your toes. Uh, but it's just, you get used to it, you know. It's, this bike here is not as bad because it's a four stroke one. It's, it's more drivable than the two strokes. You seem to be flying here. Nah, this is over the red sport hour. I don't know, come on down now to Glen Hill. This is a quick bit here too. up to 160 around that there. Heading up next to 170. Down here to Bella Graham and we turn right for a head across to Glen Helm. What about the concentration levels required? That's next bit you have to really concentrate. Once you see the traffic lights here. As you'll see once we got to the top of the hill. Where are we now? This is heading up through Glen Helm. We call the next section or Glen Helm section. It's all about a lot of trees as you can see about it, a lot of bridges. Uh, a lot of walls, and uh, if you can get through here really good, you can gain a lot of ground. But it's, again, as you see, you can see the trees, it's dangerous, and you have to treat it with a bit of caution. How would you sum up this bit as a, a road racer section? Well, it seems to help a lot of the Irish riders because there used to be this sort of uh, riding at home. As you can see, look, it's just like the Irish road racers. And really, there's about four bridges now, kind of go from one bridge to another bridge. and forget about the bits in the middle. You can remember all the bridges in order? You can remember the bridges in order, and it, and it keeps you from getting mixed up with some of the bends. It's in between them. And the, the, this is all much the same, and we're not really changing gear much. It's just going from one of these bridges to another with a few kinks in the middle. This is the, the, the pure bit from here up to Ramsey. This section about 11 miles, it's the, what I call the pure road racing bit of the TT. There's the hotel on the right hand side there, just for the do they comment in. I like it all right, you know, but I've been at the TT that long now, I like the mountain as well, so they're not much of a lone line. That section there's the worst. I'd be more cautious. Now, in that section, we just went past and it wouldn't be anywhere else. This bit here opens up a bit again. Comes up on the Conkney Strait. It's very bumpy straight. It's very quick and very windy, as you can see, you're up in the open. How much would bumps annoy you, if at all? They would annoy you a bit, you know, it depends again on the weather. And you can get your control, look along the straight, man. Too many bumps and the wind blowing the big uh, sideways once it leaves the ground. This is quite nice down into the 11th, so it's about 135 mile an hour. It's right and left. It's on long to uh, a couple of wee walls here on the left and right, where a lot of riders clicks their, their shoulder because they're, they're very close and it's pretty quick. You can see on the right hand side there, you see the wall and you, you just rub it. Over the years, Dunlop's rivals have come and gone. Philip McCallan is one of the latest eagerly trying to dethrone King Joey. Yet these two fierce competitors have a deep respect for each other and have remained firm friends. In the Isle of Man, they frequently share the winner's rostrum, where the racing between the two is almost legendary. McCallan is seen as being single-minded, a rebel of the roads fired by a passion to be a winner. Dunlop is an admirer of the heir apparent. So much so, he'll be happy to take possession of a bike McCallan raced last season. The 750 RC45, ridden to a TT victory by his Honda colleague from Portadown. It has indeed, this is Phillips' one. That's the new 750 they had, and Phillips getting a new one. He picked to ride the uh, sewer bike, and uh, I picked the 500, so really I'm getting Phillips', Phillips one for this year. Phillips' one of the hardest riders to beat, as everybody knows, like he's, he's a brilliant uh, TT rider. Uh, he's a brilliant rider all around. That's why he's getting this special one. He's young and Honda's don't want to lose him. <laughs> so I can't complain because I get the 500. But at the same time, I think Philip will be wondering what I'm doing. 
Let's put it that way. <laughs> no one fell out. Joey's different to everyone else, you know. He rides so hard on road races, you know, he gives nothing either. When he's out there to promote his bike and win his races, he's going. And uh, it's hard riding. We've touched a few times. We've, like, clashed at high, high speed. And uh, But when he gets off the bike, it's still unbelievable. You know, he, he comes along, he borrows stuff from me, I borrow stuff from him, and there's no problem. But when you deal with a lot of other people, they just wouldn't give you stuff. They don't want beaten, and um, they wouldn't give you it. But he's just uh, he's just himself, and he's like been world multi world champion, and it still hasn't affected him. Some people get an Irish championship or a British championship, and they think they're god. But uh, Joey's still the same, and he's been world champion. So, and he's got MBEs and OBEs. So, he's nothing more to prove, and uh, he still just chugs along. Philip's the man to beat, I think, on this, and the 250, even on the 600 as well. But the only problem is, I have won more 250s, and, and he's won, and, and he's still worried about me. The more I worry about him, he worries a lot about me too. So It's going to be very interesting between the both of us. That's enough to set the pulses racing for the new season. Always a deep thinker, Dunlop has never underestimated the TT course, particularly the very fast mountain mile after Ramsey, which can be shrouded in mist and fog. This is Ramsey Square, it's, it's very slow again. It's very, very deceiving. You can into it and think you're going slow enough and not going slow enough at all. This is just heading up now over Brady Ramsey Herbin. This is me back, don't see this, it's a bit bumpy and rough. You can see the mountain away in the, in the back then. That's, uh, but believe it or not, once you get up to that bit, you're looking forward to get up this. You get a wee bit of a rest, especially with your arms. You know, because you've been pulling so much coming up. And this is Ramsey Herbin now. This is where you see it heading up. You can see it in the camera there, the way it heads up now, really steep. This comes on up to the waterworks, just in the wall on the other side of the waterworks. 100 foot of a drop. It's like it's down, it's just straight over, it's just straight down the side of the mountain along this here, especially up here, this bit here. Now, can he hear you at all? No, no, he not know anything. Sometimes you can see the shadow, but it's only now and again. And this is heading on up now with the gooseneck. This is one of the steepest parts of the, of the mountain fall. It's, it's difficult. It sits a lot of the, the short circuit riders, uh, so it does make cause it's open. And they can see the track and see the road and you can go really quick on it. it took me a long, long time. At the, first of my career at the TT, getting used to the mountain. I used to be I'm pretty good on it, but I had to concentrate on it and get used to it. It used to be too open for me. How would you describe your riding of the mountain in the last, say, 10 years or so? Okay, it's, it's come on a lot, and also the bikes has come on a lot, because the bikes is made now for that, for good smooth roads and, and not sort of or not progressing as much. That's just left to leave the gooseneck there the whole way up. So I've uh, got through Memorial, be the next one, just after the bridge, you head on up the hill. That's what about slip streaming in a situation like this? It's difficult to see the mountain the way the road curves. The mountain's really not that straight, but you have to be careful not to. Like, you know curbs, or you know you know run off area at all, and, and both sides of the roads so were warned and were uh, briefing before the, the practice really starts. There's usually a drain along the side of the road for the water, along over all over the mountain. So once you go to that white line in the road, see you go ease off because there's always a drain. This is along the it's along the mountain mile now. This is a really quick bit and it's the way the valleys and the mountain works it's very one day in places. One minute you're sheltered and the next minute you're not. Tell me about possibly making up ground here. No, not really. Not this bit. There's a black pot. You make up the ground just just after this wee bit, you get round the veranda. This is all pretty, pretty straightforward. And you get to this, this next bright hand bit here. That's a bit tricky, believe it or not. And the big drain along and say that. And down through, you turn main ground from here. 
you know, you get into a lot of old tricky bends. And you see this next one's like four bends all in a row, you go out and then through the white line all the time. You buy out again, and you buy in again. What about getting lines right here at this point? Well, I have to get that. If you don't get that right, you're going to lose ground. And again, because it's so quick and four bends in a row, it's hard to get right. Did you hear him cover? No. <laughs> That's what I say, maybe you're better not, because it's, it's passed before you realise it. I hate getting a touch whenever I get the bike. But this is good, because you someday good, and it's going as quick as you to follow. It really helps you along, and it, it makes the lap go a lot shorter. This is over the tram lines here. Just you go over the tram lines, just there, like where he is. And then you head back up, another lap up the mountain. Obviously, as people are watching this, they can see a bit of mist. Tell me about the problems that has caused. When well, you can have a bit of problem with the mist, as you can see, damp places in the road there. You have to watch that as well when you get misty conditions. And again, the same as an ordinary car, you don't go too close to the block in front of you because he may have to brake for the block in front of him at some time or other. Because there's a lot of people out on the track that doesn't know the track the way maybe I would know it, or maybe he would know it. You have to be careful. I know the TT is dangerous, but so's, so's every race track. Like, there's been people killed at every race track in the world, or most of them. There have been people killed at some of the safest tracks. You don't have to have, have, have roads or, or trees to get people killed. But that's what keeps me going to the TT. I, I work at my own bikes and I, and I really enjoy the TT and I don't take any chances. I have scared myself. I have, I would say, ran onto the grass like, and I have near saved and all that, but at the same time, if I'm really struggling, I know to ease off. You know, I know if I'm beat, I'm beat. And uh, I think if people would do that at the CT, that wouldn't be as bad. Like. Joey himself is a bit of an odd fella. Uh, but, I mean, uh, an incredible road racer. Uh, he's won 21 Isle of Man TTs, a uh, great achievement. And uh, really, Joey is a superstar in his own right, and in fact, I would put him in the same uh, category as George Bess. The worst accident you had was uh, Brands Hatch, Easter 1989. You were 37 then. Did it cross your mind, perhaps, because it was a really bad one, that I should give this sport up? I did actually think I would be giving it up. And then after... I talked a lot to people and people like, that wasn't my fault and when I discovered it wasn't my fault I wanted to go back again and I don't really, really think I'd ever won races again like but once I got going and got back to TT now again I started off on a V125 and I never rode a 125 and I started and I went well the 125 and then I rode the 750 and I remember finishing 20th at the Ulster Grand Prix and another half lap had been lapped and people was laughing at me, telling me to forget about it. Like I was finished, like, can I not contempt myself? And uh, give it up. But I rode on and the next year was a wee bit fitter again. And I went to the TT and I was lying second to Robert, the 125, when I broke down. And I came back to the Ulster Grand Prix and I won it. They weren't laughing then? They weren't laughing. <laughs> so what was that? The Dunlop family have been to Buckingham Palace on two occasions. In 1986 to receive an OBE for services to racing. And in 1996 there was an MBE for mercy missions to Bosnia and Albania. Dunlop, however, had to wait for another palace date to finally meet the Queen. I went to a garden party one time. Uh, for all the, the world championships of uh, Britain. Uh, the Queen was there, but we were kept behind bars and, and we didn't really get talking to her. And then uh, we invited uh, this time to uh, a party in Buckingham Palace. Just not really a party, just a get together. And uh, the Queen came round and talked to us all very, very, very uh, nice and, and, and had a glass of champagne with us. And it was brilliant, unbelievable. Tell us a nice story about you being arrested in Albania and how you got out of it. I got arrested the minute I arrived in Albania. I got about a mile down the road till I was stopped with it. 
the communist police because it was partly communist at the time I was there. And there was two sets of police, one plain clothes and one uniform. And I had no permission to drive through their country. So they just arrested me and took the van and all them, the barracks, and kept me there for a few hours. And, and uh, we were looking at the van and they saw the sticker in the front of the van and motorbikes. And the good luck, the chief bloke was was really into 500 Grand Prix and, and Formula One cars. And I, he asked me about it, and I had a motorcycle news, and there was a photo of me in the motorcycle news, and I showed it to Miss Liam Dunlop and got my passport out and showed him the Dunlop and all. And after that, a big pass free as long as I want it. <laughs> so it was hard to believe. Like, I, they just gave me this pass, and he signed it, and I was stopped a lot of times afterwards. And as soon as I showed them this pass, oh, sorry, Mr. Dunlop, sorry, Mr. Dunlop. And that was it. Well, down in New Zealand, Joey's a legend. He came down to New Zealand in 1994 and raced in the, the National Series. And uh, for our company, actually, he was running a little 125 Honda. And uh, at all the race meetings in New Zealand, we had the biggest crowds we'd ever had for 20 years. And most of those people had just come out to see Joey. He, he was mobbed everywhere he went. Over the years, Dunlop has amassed a treasure trove of trophies. Yet is that success down to sheer talent, plus determination and an exceptional inner strength? Even at 45, when most sports people are putting their feet up, he's still winning. How does he do it? Would a fitness test provide the answer? I used to keep breath and fat over the winter. It's the last few years, I haven't been in the nearest fat since I got hurt at that time. But I do a bit, you know, just bits and pieces. But I never used equipment like this before, but I'm going to have to start looking into it or else retire. You use your legs a lot more than people realise. Uh, but my legs is pretty good, I can it's, it's more my shoulder. And that's half the time I get hurt. That's the only two places that really gives me trouble. Otherwise, it's not too bad. The physical demands of, of a TT where they're exercising for over two hours, they are doing multiple uh, muscular contractions, which are static in nature. So in other words, the muscle isn't actually moving in terms of lengthening, but they are performing multiple contractions. Uh, so the, the event itself would be very physically demanding and would call, would call for um, quite a high endurance capacity in terms of stamina, which Joey would show from his results would be a natural phenomenon rather than a training phenomenon, as we know he doesn't do that much physical training. The measurements that we've made um, give us a, a comparison of Joey against, for instance, an endurance athlete, but they tell nothing of his ability to ride a motorbike. And um, I, I do feel that somebody continuing to compete, continuing to compete, very successfully at his age, must have a degree of natural born, inborn ability, which um, is phenomenal. Phenomenal indeed. It's time to unveil the new bikes. A new season is just around the corner. So too, more anxious moments for wife Linda and the family. More glory, perhaps, at major events like the Isle of Man. More celebrations like this for a living legend. Have you maybe thought about saying to him, is it not time you were packing it up? No, no, definitely not, because it's all that the two of us knows, and that was all our friends that's involved around motorcycles, so while he's fit, and that we keep on racing. Did you ever think you'd still be going in 1997? No, I never did, no. I thought after... Like, after I'd finished with the Formula One races, that would do me, but I couldn't, I couldn't settle at home, like... No, I don't make a matter of settle at home, I couldn't settle myself to... to just stay at home and... and work on the bar or do after had to, had to get out and get going, keep going. Well, he's just the same person as I married 25 years ago and, uh, well, I don't see the things that other people probably see. <laughs> Linda never really bored me a big lot. Like she always backed me and, and never said where I was to go or where I wasn't to go. And uh, one year I was thinking about packing it up and, and and maybe get myself a better place at home. And, uh, and I thought, no. So. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> that was it. Outsiders, people like me, who admire the sport and who like the sport, we think, how do they concentrate for 37 and three quarter miles when you really cannot make a mistake, which could maybe cost you your life? I think once you get concentrating on the race, and you concentrate on your fits and your signs from the Isle of Man, you forget about everything else. You just go from A to B, and B to C, and C back to A, and A to B, and it, 
you can really get excited and get going. Philip's one of the best examples at the TT because he really gets going at times. And people are really looking forward and Philip coming because he's really head below the screen. I'm the same only I don't show it just the same as Philip does, but that's exactly how it works. Yeah, I go from starting finish to Ballock Rain. I go from Ballock Rain to Ballock Bridge. If I'm really concentrating, I don't care about anybody else. I'm just interested in how quick I can go. I just concentrate in one wee bit and then forgets about it and then concentrates another wee bit. I'm not trying to beat the course now because you'll never beat the course, put it that way. You know. uh, the course will always, will always be there, it'll all be the same, it doesn't matter how much you learn it. You're still going to get into trouble at times, you're still not going to go 100%. You're still going to get into trouble with the weather. You know, there's so many things in the course, you can't, you can't beat the course, the course will always beat you. And riders, you just have to take them as they come. I went through so many and, it, and, and so many good races and I just have to be one of the little ones that stuck it to the better end. I learned things years and years ago with breaking chains and running out of fuel and I, you never won the race the tire flag comes down. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is in. I knew that and uh, I always remember that and I always keep that in my mind. Especially uh, at the DD because it's so long. I saw me five miles ago and not making it. And I never forget it. But uh, that's the same thing. You have to work the thing out. And I know the TT so well. I know the fuel situation. I know the problems because I've been there so long. And uh, a lot of the younger riders, they'll have to learn it. They should know it maybe in their ways, but they don't take it and they don't believe it till it happens to you. Nobody lose nothing until such times as it says, oh, not not happen, not not happen. But it does happen. And once the things that happens to them, then they change. You know, people say, so you're chilling up right. You're chilling up right whenever you want to five and two laps or four laps. But that does. But I know a fight everybody wants to beat me. It doesn't matter what, whether it's the TT or where it is. It doesn't really bore me now because, like, I'm not out to beat them. <laughs> we used to be. They're out to beat me, and if they want to beat me, they can beat me. It doesn't really bore me a lot. How important are the two weeks that you're spending here in this workshop? It's very important to me this year. I didn't do it last year, the year before, and I actually I paid the penalty because I'm noticing stuff on Phillips back. It should have been on mine this last two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a difficult year and a hard year. And I missed half of last year because I'd get hurt. And I had to get myself going and, and my own mind as well. Come on, sit to me. When the maid joined on after broke the mould and threw it away, and that's the only way you can describe him, you know. I get the impression you're excited about another season. I'm looking forward to this year because I'm telling you, I missed half of last year, and uh, I want to get going again because it was my own fault last year. So <laughs> I have to prove a point.